or to Mark, Mark 2, I guess Mark 2 would be the right way to say it. I thank the guys that helped in Miami Beach today, Brother Charlie Preach down there, and Brother Andrew taught Sunday school class and it made it a much easier day for me today. I figured out something, I learned a little trick. I sent a, ta a list, or a, what is it, thing? a text, that's what they call those things? I sent a list, I sent a text, a short text, to Mr. Taj last night. I am notoriously brief sometimes when texting people. You know, my mom will send me a text, a big long five, six sentences, and I'll say, right, or yes, or it was good, you know, or whatever, you know, she'll ask a lot of questions and that sort of thing. I think texts are supposed to be short, but uh, I sent a brief one to Tosh last night. I said something like, I'm not coming to teen activity. I won't make it tomorrow. And what I meant by that is if I went to teen activity last night, then it would probably be the proverbial straw that broke pastor's back and made it so that I couldn't make it through church on Sunday. Sunday's a long day, and I actually have to pace myself a little bit to be ready for it on a normal basis. And so they stepped up, man. I got here this morning, and Taj is here wearing bells and looking bright and chipper and ready to go. And he said, Charlie's ready to preach. And all he said, just planning on me not being here. So I'm going to go ahead and like schedule my funeral. <laughs> oh, well, don't, 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 don't for a Sunday. <laughs> People are going to be like, whoa, pastor's gone. Let's go. I'll take over. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I've never seen him so happy. Just like, here, it's like, wow, you know, the pastor's gone. We're going to have a good day. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate you guys and your help and being willing to cover for me in my death or absence or whatever <laughs> yes. I think we're going to fire me in the business meeting tonight I'm going to propose it I do every year I guess. <laughs> okay hey let's uh, I want to look at uh, this evening I want to look at a perspective about Jesus and this is a passage of scripture that has made such an impression on me that oftentimes when I think of the gospel or I think of uh, priorities or really when I think about who Jesus is, this is a passage that kind of comes up in my mind as one that has shaped my understanding of the <coughs> ministry of Jesus. And uh, I hope that we'll be able to see that this evening as, as we get to it. I want to just read uh, verses 1 uh, down to about verse 4, I think. And this is about Jesus and right after He began His earthly ministry. Mark really gets right into right into the ministry of Jesus. He doesn't spend a lot of time with genealogies. He announces Him with uh, being baptized by John the Baptist and then His ministry starts. And Mark is a very terse, very short gospel. And his perspective is one that really highlights key truths regarding Christ's ministry. And so keeping that in mind, when Mark shares the miracles, he really, I think, in a way that resonates with me better than any of the other uh, gospel writers, really gets the diamond or gets the point of what's said and brings it to the forefront. I mean, just one of those really terse, very blunt kind of statements. And we're going to see one of those in our text this evening. I hope it will help you with your perspective as a Christian when you learn what to value about Jesus. In verse 1 of Mark 2, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four, and when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Now we'll pray, Father, please help us with our understanding of the Scripture. Help us not to overemphasize something that isn't the, the crux or the, the main point of our text. But God, help us to emphasize more than anything else the miracle of regeneration. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Many times, uh, <laughs> this is the passage of Scripture. You know, when you're taking a preaching class or a homiletics class, they talk about, you know, good exegesis or accurate Bible preaching. And I've, I don't know how many times in a 
preaching class or in a book about preaching, I have seen it written, you know, that a lot of guys misinterpret Scripture, and this is one of those classic ones where, you know, they couldn't come nigh because of the press, and the press was in the way back then, the press was fake news back then, and it is, still is today, and so forth. You wouldn't believe it, but I've actually heard guys that pretty much just rant when they preach, and I've heard them go off on the press a little bit. They'll go off, they'll start off some way like this, saying, I know this isn't the same kind of press, but it has a lot of similarities to the press, and then they'll go off about how you can't trust the media and so forth. That's not quite the point of Mark chapter 2, although it is a very fun one. And if ever it gets late at night and we're preaching for the fun of it, and we're not preaching the Word like Jesus was, but we're preaching our Word, uh, that would be a good direction, I suppose, to go with the text or the context. The reality of it is, is that this is a packed house. When we talk about packed house, it's pretty packed. There have been a couple of times here at our church where we've had a pretty good crowd. Remember our 10-year anniversary and everybody was having to stand in here and, you know, the back was full, the front was full, and people kind of falling out the doors and all those sort of things. It's fun to have a good packed house. But even in those situations, you'd be surprised how many more people you could fit in a building than we're accustomed to in the United States. Sometime for fun, if you like to, go to a South American country and just watch transportation or just go somewhere else where there's no transportation rules or laws. I was preaching... Uh, what they call in, in Guyana, South America, a crusade one time. And uh, they, uh, they call them buses down there. They hired out buses to bring people in. It's not a bus. It's a, uh, you know, one of the old-style Toyota vans. You know, a seven-seater Toyota van. And in one of those Toyota vans, not like yours, brother, the old small ones. You know what I'm talking about? Here's a Honda, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Well, you know, not like the newer style that are actually kind of bigger inside. An old Toyota van. And the one with the, that's a, that's a uh, Volkswagen, but they look about like that. Uh, so anyway, one of those vans, they brought 30 people to church in one of those vans. And not, not 30 people several trips. I mean, when they showed up, they had 30 people on the van. The driver got paid per person that he brought, and he got 30 in there. They were standing on the running boards. They were just like sitting on each other's laps inside, sitting on the roof, standing on the roof. 30 people came in a van. And I'm telling you, it would have been probably, maybe possible to put another person in that van, but probably not. Something had to give at some stage, some point. Those Toyotas are tough. Those old Toyotas, something's going to break when you overload a vehicle that badly. That thing is full. And so when I think of this house where Jesus is, I sort of think in my mind, the closest thing I can reckon it to, which is that Toyota van. Sometimes we have teen activities where uh, Mr. Taj did this a couple years ago where he had a caption for a scavenger hunt. I can't believe we all fit in that. And so my group, who was I think about seven of us, have a picture of us in a shopping cart. Seven of us in a shopping cart. And, uh, you know, I can't believe, I think we won that one too. We won that one. We got seven of us in a shop. That's a pretty full shopping cart. It's not recommended for the average shopping cart, but, you know, can't believe we all fit in that. I think of things like that when I think of the press. And so I imagine a house, in my mind, that's sort of like that van as far as the proximity of people. You know, maybe you could get somebody else in that van, but probably not. Uh, maybe you could get another person in the shopping cart, but we, we optimized that thing. We maximized our real estate on it. Maybe you could do that. But this house, if you think about it, uh, needed a, the capacity to bring somebody in who is being carried on a bed. And that makes things even more difficult, you see. So the house was packed, it was full. People obviously couldn't get in, but on top of that, this fellow couldn't, you know, even weasel or worm his way in because he didn't even have the physical ability himself. And uh, his friends helped him. Okay? That's where we come into our context. I want to look at why the man came to Jesus. And it's very, very clear from the context, actually. In verse uh, 5, verse 4, the last part of the verse, the Bible says, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. So, they broke through the roof. <clears throat> Not on the roof. They broke through the roof and they lowered the man into Jesus. I suppose somehow room was made. And if you can imagine being in a room and everybody's pressed in, and then they just drop somebody on top of you. You know, I mean, <laughs> he got some space, the man did. He got 
next to Jesus. There are some implied, some implied truths here. The truth is implied that this man wanted to come to Jesus. In other words, his friends weren't just like, hey man, tell you what, we're going to take you to Jesus. And he said, yeah, okay, if it's, you know, if it's simple or if it's easy. No. The, man who, the men who lowered this man down were still on the roof. In other words, he wasn't with a group of people that were trying to get to Jesus. He was trying to get to Jesus and his friends helped him. You understand the difference, don't you? You ever had somebody try to rope you along, try to bring you along to something? Uh, you know, a lot of us got saved that way. We had a friend that said, hey, you want to come to a meeting or you want to go hear this or uh, whatever. He got you to something and then you heard the gospel and God spoke and God worked. And it's good to have a friend like that, but this man had friends who helped him, but they didn't get to Jesus in the same way that he did. You see that from the Scripture? Whereas this man wanted access to Jesus and his friends got them there, got him there, but they were still on the roof having lowered him in. I don't know how high the roof was, if it was a low roof and they were handing him down, or if they were using ropes to lower him down, but the idea is that he's on the roof, they're on the roof, and then he's lowered in and they're still on the roof. Now I'm sure they can stick their heads in and they have access. You know, I'm sure they can see what's going on, but they don't have the same access to Jesus that this man did. Think of that. Think on that for a moment. Here's a man who doesn't have the physical ability to move himself, and he got nearer to Jesus than the people who did. And I think that's implied in the, in the text, in the context. In other words, they, of course, got him to Jesus. <laughs> But the point that I'm trying to make is that this man wanted to get to Jesus. He wanted to get to Jesus. The second implied truth, and it's more than just implied, Jesus emphasizes it, is that the man did not come to Jesus for physical healing, but for forgiveness of sins. See, so many times when I was a kid and I heard this story told, you know, you see it illustrated and you just think about how much somebody wanted to get to Jesus so he could be healed so he could walk. And that actually isn't what the text is emphasizing in the least, in the slightest. This man wanted to get to Jesus for his sins to be forgiven. So see verse 5, will you? Look there. When Jesus saw their faith, He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And you do not see a response by the man sick of the palsy. You do not see him saying, well, thank you, Jesus. But yesterday I heard you healed a leper. And I was wondering if maybe you could help me with my palsy. You don't see a response from the man in the, in the entire context, do you? You don't see him saying anything. He came to Jesus... The Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, not His, just His, but the faith of His friends, then Jesus said to him, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now Jesus is not trying to show off to the scribes. He's not just saying, I'm going to make a point here. I'm going to show them what really matters. No, He is meeting the need of a man <coughs> whose need was to have his sins forgiven. Now friend, we cannot stop short of that understanding this evening. So many times we come to God just the way a homeless man comes to us on the street and we tell God what our need is, but it really isn't. You know, a homeless person doesn't need a hotel for the night. A homeless person doesn't need a meal. A homeless person needs whatever is causing their homelessness to be dealt with. It's something sustainable. You say, well, pastor, to some degree, maybe a meal would help. Well, if it would, then good. But that isn't the need. The need isn't, you know what, my whole life, if I could just have had a meal. If for one night of my life I could have had a hotel, my problems would go away. No. People will tell you, you know, I just need money. I just need this physical problem to go away. I just need, I just need. And actually, this man came to Jesus realizing what his need was. His need was that he was a sinner and he needed to be forgiven.
for his sin. And Jesus immediately upon seeing his faith <coughs> said, Thy sins be forgiven thee. And the man got what he came for. And you don't see a commentary. You don't see him saying, well, actually, that isn't what I came for. Actually, how many times have you tried to share the gospel with somebody who told you the gospel wasn't their need? And I have a lot of times. It's the season, folks. I get three or four calls a day. I've had some really special calls the last couple of days where people are just brokenhearted been able to minister to people. It's, been, it's really been a great opportunity. I had a couple in the middle of the night last night. Just opportunities where people are just broken and just calling. But for the most part, people are saying, I need, you know, I'm gonna, I'm about to move out of my place and I need somebody to pay my rent. Or I need this, or I need, I need, I need, I need. And you try to talk to them about Jesus and they, they don't want that from a church. They don't want that from a pastor. They want anything spiritual. They want something physical. Now I know that we have some cliches and some adages that contradict the Scripture but make us sound wise to talk about, you know, feed a person and then you have an opportunity to... Now, if a person won't, isn't concerned with spiritual matters, spiritual things, my friend, they're playing games when it comes to spiritual things. In other words, you think, well, you know something, I'll, you know, I'll give them whatever they ask for just so that they'll listen to me. If a person won't listen, they won't listen. You know, and that's kind of mostly true. That, again, that's, that's not an adage. It's not something that you know you need to make a law, but you ought to have discernment about. This man came to Jesus. He had a sin problem. And Jesus forgave his sins. And upon forgiving his sins, Jesus, who uh, the same way that he knew that Sarah laughed, remember the story of uh, the angels, the three men that came to Jesus? And two of them went on to, to see Lot. But the, one of them, you know, we, we know is the Lord Jesus. And Sarah was behind the curtain and she laughed quietly or laughed inside. And he said, why would you laugh? And she said, I didn't laugh. And he said, yes, you laughed. How did he know that? Well, because he's the Lord. He knows everything. Jesus knows everything. And because Jesus knew what the uh, religious leaders were thinking, in verse 6, the Bible says there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins? But God only. The Bible says when immediately when Jesus perceived in His Spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, He said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? And he asked a practical question. Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk? So why are you asking that question in your heart? What's easier? To say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk? Well, that's a question that needs perspective, actually. To say something is simple, but for it to be true is complicated. For Jesus to be able to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, He has to be God, and He has to die for sin. So the answer to the question is, thy sins be forgiven thee, is much more difficult for Jesus than rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Right? So the question is for Jesus, which is the hardest? Well, humanly speaking, meaningless words are easy, but meaningful words are impossible. And the simple answer, humanly speaking, is that both of those actually physically, humanly, are not possible. If I, with truth, am going to try to say to somebody that I've forgiven sins, my friend, that's a lie. I cannot. It's impossible. With man, that's impossible. If I am going to say, rise, take up thy bed, and walk, I do not have the virtues or powers to heal. And so that's also impossible. So the simple answer to the question, humanly speaking, both are impossible, but for God, which is the most difficult? What's the bigger deal for God? What had Jesus rather do? Say, arise, take up thy bed and walk, or go to the cross? There's a grand difference between the cost, between the sacrifice that Christ had to make in order to be able to say, thy sins are forgiven thee. Friend, I want to remind you, God has never forgiven anyone's sins outside of the blood of 
of Jesus Christ. No one is in heaven for any other reason than that Jesus died for their sins. But no one. There are many times we play our little games where we say, well, this is a really good person. I heard it a Christian, a person I believe was born again the other day extolling the virtues of Mother Teresa. Somebody I think is born again, they just talked about how wonderful Mother Teresa was. She's in hell. As far as I know. Because she did good works. But she embraced works for her salvation. My friend, no person's in heaven for any reason other than that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. And so in short, for Jesus, the words, thy sins be forgiven thee, are a far greater statement, require far more sacrifice. <coughs> for man, both are impossible. For God, both are possible. But the forgiveness of sins is only possible through the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And my friend, that is far more difficult. And so Jesus said to the scribes, here's why I'm going to heal this man. So that you can know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. That you may know, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thy house, thine house and immediately arose and took up his bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Jesus healed the man who's sick of the palsy, who was sick of the palsy, not because that's why he came. He healed the man who was sick of the palsy to show that he had the power on earth to forgive sins. In other words, to do the one, he must be able to do the other. And so the miracles that Jesus did, as we see in other testaments of the Scripture, showed that He was God. Nicodemus acknowledged that. Anyone who was honest about it acknowledged that the miracles that Jesus did, no man could do except God be with Him. Only God could do the things Jesus did. How do we apply this? Well, I think first of all, the matter of emphasis. You know, Christians oftentimes tend to be more impressed with an experience or a story of something which is humanly impossible, but really a simple thing with God, than they are for something that is not only possible only for God, but possible with great sacrifice. What's a bigger deal? That Jesus healed us a man who had palsy or that Jesus gave eternal life to a man with palsy? What changed the man's life the most? Eternal life. And friend, I think that sometimes we had rather see God do something which is temporary but more flashy or more showy than we had rather see God do something which is eternal and is God's main, main business. I think sometimes we'd be more impressed to have a crowd of a thousand gather and have a great time than we would to have 50 people come to know Jesus as their Savior. The reality of it is, if a crowd gathers and one gets saved, it's a wonderful thing. And if 51 gather and 50 get <laughs> saved, it's exponentially wonderful. Sometimes we don't think that things that are a big deal to God are a big deal. You know I'm that way. I think you probably are as well. I can't remember, <laughs> can't remember all the people that have gotten saved that I've seen get saved. 
Why is that? Well, for one thing, I don't make a real point of keeping track. I don't notch my Bible or put a check mark somewhere or anything like that. I do try to pray for people that God's used uh, me, my ministry, to lead to Jesus. But I'll be honest with you, I think the reason I don't think too much about it is because it probably doesn't impress me enough. The miracle of salvation. And whenever I reflect on this passage in Scripture, I realize that I ought to be more impressed by it. I think that, to some degree, experience has shown me that amazing things are commonplace with God. So maybe the newness of something amazing is not as impressive to me just because I've seen it before, you know? You ever see a guy that can dunk and you're impressed by it, but then you see a bunch of guys that can dunk and then you see the guy dunk and you see him dunk the same way, you're like, okay, we'll dunk differently. You know? In other words, you're impressed, but after you've seen him do it, you realize, okay, he can do it. And to some degree, I've seen God save souls and I've seen him do it so often that I'm not surprised. And I think to some degree that's a healthy attitude for a Christian. Sometimes I talk to believers and they're witnessing to people that they don't believe will get saved. And I just think, you have no idea what God can do. I talk to people, they say, oh, you know, my brother, you know, I'm witnessing to him, but I don't think he's ever going to get saved. God saved you. Salvation's a miracle. Of course he can get saved. I'm witnessing to my dad, and I just, you know, and then they, their, their dad gets saved, and they're like, my dad got saved. can't believe my dad got saved. And I think, well, I can. I, that's the way God works. That's what He does. Friend, we need to be really careful about this matter of being impressed by things. <coughs> Sometimes we had rather have a great story about how God answered a prayer I'm not diminishing that. I'm not diminish I'm not saying, hey, this guy, you know, it didn't matter to him that he was healed of the palsy. I'm not saying that. I think that all in all, he had a pretty good day. <laughs> God forgave my sin, and then he healed me and told me to take my bed home. It's the first time I've ever been able to do that. It's a good day. Imagine he had a lot to talk about the rest of his life. It's a big day for him. I'm not saying it wasn't a big deal. But what I am saying to you, my friend, is that the really big deal is God's ability to save a lost soul. Whenever you and I are exposed to how destroyed a person is when they're dead and their trespasses and sins, and then we see the miracle of salvation and we see literally what regeneration can do in the life of a believer, my friend, that is amazing. And it really ought to be the thing that we want to see. Everybody there, I'm sure, said, I want to see that guy get healed. Sure. But that wasn't the most impressive thing. The most impressive thing was that Jesus died for this man's sin and had the right to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee. And friend, you come to Jesus today, God will see your faith and your faith will make you whole because of what Jesus did. He died, He was buried, and He rose again so that your sins can be forgiven. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? It's an impressive truth. How about we as believers ask God to just work in our hearts to help us to be appropriately impressed with the greatest truth. Father, thank You for what we've learned this evening. I pray that You would help us to remember it. Help it to impress us. Help us to see things more from Your perspective and less from ours so we could be more effective in living for You. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
begin in verse chapter uh, 2, verse number 1 in Philippians, and uh, we will uh, read down to verse 4. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Father, I pray that you would help us this evening as we look at our duty before you and our responsibility to it toward one another to have a better grasp and philosophy about our lives that's affected by the reality that we are in Christ. We pray in His name. Amen. Well, yes or no? Are there any? Is there any consolation in Christ? In other words, you, you gave up some things for the Lord Jesus. Is there anything worthwhile in Jesus? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is there any comfort in, in Christ's love? Yeah. yeah. Is there any fellowship of the Spirit that, that helps with anything that you have lost for Jesus? Yes. yes. And uh, any bowels and mercies? In other words, have you found that your Savior is one who has like compassion or like feeling with us. Have you, ever, have you ever realized that God is compassionate towards you? And we could say yes extremely. Right? In other words, uh, lost the world, gained Jesus. And we could say lost nothing, gained everything. And we could say the same about just about everything. Isn't it so? In other words, <laughs> I, I tire of and I mock uh, the pity party testimonies. You know, I, I was successful in every way the world has to gauge or measure success. I had everything. I had relationships. I had money. I had cars. I had free time. I had everything. And then I got saved. I lost everything I had. I lost my money. I lost my free time. I lost my car. I lost my relationships. I gave it all up. But it's been worth it. You ever heard the crybaby testimony or the bragging testimony? Like, I got saved for God's benefit, but I didn't really get anything from it. How many of y'all heard a testimony? I know it isn't that way. I'm being a little sarcastic about it. But you know what I'm talking about? We talk about how great things were before we came to Jesus. And now things are terrible, but bless God, we're just such wonderful believers that it's all worth it because of our resolve to love God. And that's nonsense, isn't it? That's stupid. I said stupid. I'm allowed to say that in this context. I'm also allowed to say it. Remember why? Because I'm pastor. And sometimes pastor has to express things that way. Okay, so no one else is allowed to say that unless you're a pastor. If you, if you, uh, if you become pastor, then you can say it as well. That's the rule for using the word. Make sure we qualify that so everybody knows we're all on the same page. The reality of it, though, is, is that it's absolutely ludicrous to insinuate that you gave anything to God or for God in any kind of comparison with what you gained in Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, I, I gave nothing and gained everything. That's the reality of it. And it's for you as well or anybody who is honest about it. I don't think it's a far stretch for me to say that it's, it really is just pride that has us to present anything any other way, isn't it? It's really seeking to have people glory in us or look at us and glory in us. And you know, uh, some people did that. Do you, if you'll recall, there was a man by the name of Barnabas who had a field and sold it and gave the money. To the, put it at the apostles' feet. And then there were some people that wanted the same kind of recognition that he got. You remember what happened to them? <laughs> that was Ananias and Sapphira. They lied to the Holy Ghost and they were killed. 
uh, subsequently. And I think if I were to just summarize what sin Ananias and Sapphira committed or what was the cause of it, it was that they wanted people to be impressed with them. Anytime we want someone to be impressed with us, we're really unconcerned that people are impressed with who they ought to be impressed with, and that's God. In other words, we want the glory instead of giving it to God. And in order to honestly give God the glory, we have to be honest about how we stand in Him. And I do believe that the Apostle Paul is speaking to a church who is indeed actually suffering, speaking indeed from a place of physical suffering as he is in a prison cell penning these words to the church at Philippi. I believe he's speaking from that perspective but when he speaks of the consolation, I believe he's speaking as an exaggeration, as in, I wonder if it'll be worth it for me to be in prison for eternal life. I wonder if it'll be worth it for me to be imprisoned and isolated for the fellowship that's in Christ Jesus. I wonder if it'll be worth it. I wonder if it'll be worth it. And of course, the answer is inexpressibly so. In other words, way more than expression could convey the meaning. Isn't it true? Okay, so... Paul goes on to say, if this is true, he said, he said then, then fulfill my joy. If any of this is true, fulfill my joy that ye be like-minded. Now, he is writing to the church at Philippi, Philippi, telling them what kind of a mindset. You see, if you're looking for the theme of Philippians, it's in like-minded. That's where the theme's at. It's in the mindset that you need to have in the midst of suffering. And Paul said, this is my mindset when people preach the gospel antagonistically, thinking to add to my bonds, he said, my mindset is the gospel's preached and people are coming to Jesus and I'm thrilled to death. And he said, if there's anything good in your suffering, fulfill my joy that ye also be like-minded. In a minute, uh, if we were to go on, we would read that Paul told the church at Philippi, let this mind, or mindset, would be a word we'd understand. Let this mindset be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but gave, made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and so on and so forth. So, no question, in Philippians, Paul is telling the church at Philippi how to think, what their mindset needs to be. A mindset, it really is all the battle, actually, isn't it? How you think. I'm always amazed, athletically, how many people I can beat at basketball. Now, I know you're not amazed because I've probably beaten you, and so you know it just happens all the time. <laughs> right, Shamir? Shamir, you ever beat me at basketball? I never played basketball. Yeah. Now, you, you wouldn't because it would be so demoralizing you'd never play basketball at all. So, anyway. <laughs> it's amazing what mindset it is. Taj and I always laugh about this. We'll take on teenagers that can do things athletically we can't do anymore, or maybe never could do. You know, we'll take on, for instance, Fuji. Fuji can grab the ball, and he's pretty near making a pretty nice dunk right now. And he's got a reach and arms and defensive ability that I can't begin to rival, and Taj never could. <laughs> But if you take him and you take Anthony or him and, and uh, Winsky or he and whoever else, maybe Mr. Taj can beat them. We can beat them at basketball just about any time they play. They're faster than us. They're more skilled than us. They have a better shot than we do. They have better athletic ability, but they do not have our mindset. My mindset is I've got gazer powers. And you may be better, but I'm going to trick you. And I'm going to fool you into losing. And I, always, and I know that I can because I've always done it. And their mindset is, I don't think I can beat Pastor and Mr. Tosh. It's amazing how a defeated mindset and, and attitude that I can't be beaten affect the game. It's just amazing to me. How they, all things being unequal, they are equalizers. And a person that believes they can win and can't lose will win more often than a person who believes he can't lose will win. I mean, that he can't win will. It's just, there's just a mindset about it. You know, a person who is just determined that he's going to be positive about things, he's going to see the best in things, just will have positive, good things happen. And it's not because of, you know, the good vibrations or the good vibes that come from being positive. It's just because that's the outcome when you have a positive attitude, you have a positive outcome. It just it affects your outcome. 
So how we think is important. Brother Andrew is in the adult Sunday school series right now teaching about uh, dealing with depression, how to have victory in depression. And uh, he's going to be in a passage of Scripture next week talking about King Saul, uh, who is a poster child of failure when it comes to dealing with depression. And he's going to look at the source and the cause of it. And uh, there's a nugget there that contrasts with what you see in another week from King David when he deals, when we see how different his outcome was ultimately from Saul's. I don't want to take away from that, but I do would like to, to look at something that's there in just a moment when I get done explaining. So if you would go to 1 Samuel 13, and you can even find 2 Samuel 6, those two passages, while I explain uh, where we're going with our passage this evening, or uh, what we're learning from the Scripture this evening. There's a big difference in how your thinking affects your outcome. This past week, my wife will tell you, my phone has just been ringing, not, I won't say nonstop, but fairly constantly, from people that are needy, or people that are just having problems. All day today, all day yesterday, all day Sunday. I've been getting calls in the middle of the night from needy people lately, people that I don't even know. And it's just that time of the year. I mean, it's the time of the year, I've said it many times, that people are going through hard times, and they're going through tough times. And how a person thinks really affects how things actually are in their lives. And we as believers really need to be equipped to think, don't we, sometimes? I mean, the, honestly, sometimes we would think right if we knew how to, wouldn't we? And so I want to just speak about that this evening. And here's a common thread that I have bumped into quite a bit in conversations with people in our church and people who aren't in our church who are struggling right now. They're really struggling, particularly in the area of their thinking. One of the common threads of people who are very down and they're very depressed right now that I'm still talking to is that people are upset for the most part with things that they can do nothing about. And two, things that God hasn't required them to do anything about. I spent quite a bit of time yesterday listening to somebody telling me how upset they are with the whole mindset of the Ku Klux Klan and the fact that there's an argument that they make that the shape of the skull makes people smarter or people not smarter. Which is stupid because, uh, you know, intelligence is actually measurable. You can actually measure intelligence a lot of different ways. And it's easy to prove that the shape of the skull has nothing to do with intelligence. It's easy to prove it. But regardless, there are people that hold to that. And this person is concerned with this wrong thinking now and wondering what they should do to combat it. And to be quite honest with you, there's nothing you can, con you can do to combat such dire ignorance. Right? I mean, you, just, did you, just, you can't fix the problem. The problem is hatefulness, the problem is racism, the problem is a lot of things and you can't fix it. Something else, somebody that I've spoken with in the recent uh, future, or the recent future, the recent past, is uh, the matter of conspiracies and, and true ones and ones that aren't true. I mean, I'm telling you, I've been talking to a lot of people that are just upset about conspiring and about evil in the upper echelons and the lower echelons and evil all over the place. And my point is, is that... It's not my problem. It's not your problem to fix that. In other words, somebody who's doing something evil or who has conspired to do something or to deceive people, I probably can't fix it. I probably can't fix the problem. And <laughs> I'm not going to be, I'm not responsible to be depressed or upset about something that God hasn't put me in this world to fix. Most people who are struggling with their thinking or their mindset are struggling with things they're not responsible for. So I want to look at an example of this uh, in uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 13. Is that what I said? 1 Samuel 13 and then 2 Samuel 6. I want to just look at a, con of a, at a little bit of a con contrast. Uh, 1 Samuel 13. 
This is right after Saul's been made king of Israel, and he's, he's done a good job kind of in, in his initial hours. In verse 1, Saul reigned one year, and when he reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul and Mishmash and Mount Gibeon. And he goes on to talk about it. Um, look at verse 5. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came and pitched, came up and pitched in Mishmash eastward from Beth Avon. In verse 6, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. Now, Saul is king of Israel. The scenario is that 30,000 chariots and then ultimately a multitude like the Sea of the Sand Shore, like an innumerable host of Philistines are coming to do battle with the children of Israel, the Israelites. And the Israelites are so discouraged or afraid they're hiding in caves, in high places, and in thickets. And Saul's king of Israel, let me ask you a question, is this Saul's problem? It is, isn't it? Is the fact that God's people are scattered the problem of the person who's been anointed to be their king? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so we can clearly say that the scattering of the people is clearly Saul's problem. And I will say to you this evening that oftentimes when we look at things that are our problem and things that are not our problem, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish which is and which isn't. And we see Saul being a classic failure of not dealing with something that is his problem and trying to deal with something that isn't his problem and the subsequent catastrophic results. In verse 8, the Bible says, he tarried, speaking of Saul, all the people followed him trembling. Verse 7 says, He tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. Is that a problem for Saul? Sure. Yeah. Verse 9, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Mishmash. Therefore said I, and Saul begins to give his explanation. Go to 2 Samuel 6, will you please? I should have said chapter 7 of 2 Samuel. While you're turning to 2 Samuel 6, let me just deal with what Saul did. Saul was trying to lead the people. Samuel hadn't come, and he was creating problems for Saul. Because Samuel hadn't come to offer the burnt offering, Saul wasn't able to really have a word from God, and he wasn't able to have the spiritual support that he felt that he needed. And so what did he do? After waiting so many days, Saul offered the burnt offering himself. Because Samuel wasn't there to do what Samuel should have done, so Saul did what he felt like Samuel should have done, and as soon as he did it, right when he was finishing, Samuel shows up. We'd say in the nick of time, but actually right when it was just barely too late. And the consequence of it was that Saul was rejected by God from being king, having his seed sit on the throne forever in Israel. Serious consequences for Saul for taking on a problem that wasn't his. And I will say to you from Saul's perspective, it was difficult to discern how much of the problem was his and what wasn't. Because it was his problem that the children of Israel were scattered. And he did see the need to offer a sacrifice and a burnt offering, but the problem was is that he was not qualified to do it. And because he was not qualified to do it, it was not his problem. Christian, I just want to tell you something. There are many times in life when we feel as though we should do something, but yet we're expressly prohibited or forbidden by the Scripture to do what we want to do. I've been in many churches where ladies feel like they should step up because men won't and take the leadership. Have you? you ever seen that? Yeah. I've seen instances where ladies step into the leadership role because a man hasn't. 
I've never seen it blessed. I've seen instances where people do things because somebody ought to do something. The problem is they're not the one <coughs> that God says is supposed to do it. From this example in 1 Samuel, we see that the lie that Saul believed, which was that the offering would never have been offered if he didn't do it, was untrue, wasn't it? It would have been offered a few minutes later and it would have been acceptable to God. And the consequence would have been that if he'd offered it, if an acceptable offering had been offered, Saul wouldn't have been rejected for being king. My friend, most of the time our biggest problems come from us stepping up to do something God did not say we could do. So many times parents bail out children. I just can't let them go through this and we take away consequences. So many times I've seen churches not practice church discipline because of a circumstance or something they could see from the person's perspective of. And somebody did something that they tried to make up for something that should have been done by someone else, and yet it wasn't their responsibility. But friend, I just want to tell you something. We have a great God. We have the kind of God that you can always do right and you'll be okay. And we have the kind of God that can handle His end of the business. Do you know that the earth is not going to stop rotating unless God stops it? The old saying, life goes on. God will keep life going on until He wants it to not go on any longer. And so many times we think we've got to take matters into our own hands, but it isn't our problem. I've met some people, they don't, accept responsibility for themselves. You ever met a person that actually has their problem and they say, not my problem? There's a difference, isn't there? See, Saul had a problem. He was anointed king of Israel and he was supposed to lead the people and keep them from being scattered. But Saul was not supposed to offer a sacrifice. Saul was willing to take responsibility. The problem was he was willing to take responsibility God hadn't given him. And Christian, I just want to tell you something. Sometimes it's difficult for us to see the difference, but there is a difference and it can be seen. You can see it this evening, can't you? Samuel saw it and knew it, and Saul knew better. Everyone in national Israel knew that only the priests could offer the sacrifice. Isn't it so? There had been enough precedent for Saul to know better. What happened when strange fire was offered? What happened when Moses said, hey, you bring your censers, I'll bring mine. And we'll see who God accepts. What happened? Had God delineated the right to perform the priestly duties and to whom the right was given and required? Yeah, I think that the precedent was there. Saul knew what was right. And he excused what was right by saying, well, if somebody doesn't do something, nothing will be done. If somebody has to do something, and it'll be me. You know, a lot of depressed people are trying to do something about things that aren't their problem. Instead of letting God take care of God's business, they're trying to take care of God's business. And my friend, let me just tell you something. You can't. And you'll be judged for it. Now, Let's go to 2 Samuel 7, and well, let's read verse, uh, verse 2. Uh, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that's in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. Remember this, when King David wanted to build a temple for God, a house for God, he said, I live in a house of cedar. God lives in a tent, a tabernacle. Uh, made of curtains. And he, David is bothered, and we'd agree rightfully so, isn't he, that he is dwelling in a palace and God is living in a shack, so to speak. That's David's dilemma, isn't it? And Nathan said, well, David, just go ahead and do whatever's right in your heart. But God told Nathan different than that. God 
gave Nathan the prophet a message. Verse 4, came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord. Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Now look at verse 6. Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle, in all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me in house of cedar? God said to Nathan, Have I ever complained about the place that I live in all the time that I've walked with the children of Israel? What's the answer to that question? No. Another area that you and I oftentimes have problems is we are offended or we are upset or we are concerned for someone who we feel as though they've been slighted or things aren't right for. And one of the things that we neglect is that we don't have the right to be upset for someone else. David literally has put himself in the shoes of God in his mind. And he said, it's not fair from God's perspective for him to live in a tent and for me to live in a house of cedar. Now, I don't have God's perspective, but I'll say this, there isn't much difference for God. There isn't much difference for God. In other words, you think that a house of cedar is good enough for God, you're mistaken. If you think that a house that is made of curtains is good enough for God, you're mistaken, neither are. Because the most glorious temple that a man can build would be better than most men deserve, but still not good enough for God. And David just didn't have that perspective. David's perspective was, this isn't right. And he was offended on God's behalf for what he had and God didn't. You know, a lot of people are just upset about what some people seem to be deprived of. You know, I just don't think it will be right for me this year to eat ham and turkey and pie when there are people on the other side of the world that are eating mud and, and uh, gear oil. Well, who gave you your circumstances and who gave them theirs? Nobody's going to answer that question. God did. God did. You know, there. one of the attacks on our country today is that we've been blessed and it isn't right. I'm serious. We've had, we have parties, social parties, hypocritically, I might add, upset that the average American has it better than the average person in any other country. I say hypocritically because they have it better than the average Americans and they're upset about it. Sort of like Al Gore flying everywhere in his jet to complain about people using fossil fuel. You know, it's, it's hypocritical and they're upset. They're trying to fix problems. I'm not saying, I'm not saying we should say not my problem about everything in the world, but friend, I just want to tell you something. If there's a nation on the earth that's been cursed by God, and there's a nation on the earth that's been blessed by God. God did the blessing, and God did the cursing. And realistically, in some ways, you and I need to not interfere with what God's doing. You say, Pastor, it's easy for you to say you're on the blessed side of things. Yes, I'll acknowledge that. It's one of my frustrations with ministry in Haiti. Haiti is a nation that has been officially dedicated to Satan. And Christians want to counteract the curse of Haiti by sending lots of money there and fixing the economy. And it can't be done. Until the nation, until the people of the nation repent, until that nation represents something more than witchcraft, they'll have God's curse. And you can try and remedy God's curse as much as you like, but you will not. Does that make sense? 
There are people that are on the streets and they're homeless. And it's very, very difficult to look at them and not feel great compassion. And we ought to be compassionate. But we ought to interfere with God's curse or consequences. Wouldn't it be great if we could, you know, just house all the homeless people? It's impossible. can't be done. Because they wouldn't want to be where you housed them. Can't do it. If it were merely a matter of housing, we could just build barns. But it's not the problem. Our social problems our responsibility? It's a good question for us, isn't it? Our social problems our responsibility? I think so. I think to some degree. In other words, if social problems happen because of a godlessness, we who know Christ ought to preach godliness. Friend, I'm going to just tell you something. People that embrace Christianity don't have social problems. Those who reject Christ do. And so if a person has never heard of our Savior, we're responsible for social problems. If there's an opportunity for us to help someone and God has shown us a way to do it, we're responsible to do that. But you know what most Christians want to do? We want to fix problems that can't be fixed. We want to house people out of homelessness when their heart needs to be changed and we can't change hearts. You know what we ought to be doing about it? We ought to be preaching the gospel. We ought to be preaching hope. My friend, if they'll embrace it, it'll change their lives. It's the answer. You say, Pastor, well, you know what, I don't really like that answer. Everything else is being tried. Everything else is being tried. All the resources are being wasted trying something that cannot be accomplished. And my friend, people are trying to take care of a problem that isn't theirs. Um, David wanted to build God a house. And God's question to David was, did I ask you to? That was the question. Have I ever asked for a home? But God, you should have one. If David has one, you should have a better one. And God says, have I ever asked for one? The answer is no. Okay. And so, in verse 8, God said, Now therefore so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. Hey, big stuff. I took you out of the pasture and put you in that house. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wendest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee and house. If you were to read, you'd see a prophecy of the Messiah being David's house. You'd see that's the prophecy. God said to David, essentially, I've always taken care of you from the time I took you out of the sheepfold. I've always kept you safe. I've always provided for you. And I'm going to do more than that. I'm going to do something eternal for you, David. That's a pretty amazing promise from God, isn't it? 
One of the things God wants David to know, though, in verse 12, when the, thy days shall be filled, now, fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy father, fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Who is that? Well, not just Solomon, it's Jesus. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chase him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, who I put away before thee. And thy house, thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, did Nathan, so did Nathan speak unto David. And David goes on to discuss this with the Lord. But ultimately, David's conclusion is, okay, then it isn't my place to build a house for the Lord. But the Lord's building a house for me and a kingdom for me. And the difference between David and Saul is that David did not upon realizing what God is saying, insist upon taking upon himself something that God did not require. And consequence, the consequence of it was that God did more for David than he could have dreamed. And more for David than David could have ever done for him. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 2, shall we? Philippians chapter 2. We begin with the question, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. And the answer, it, those aren't questions, but the with the argument, if you will. The question that we ask about those things is, are there any of these things in Jesus Christ? And the answer is, yes then we're told what we should do if these things are true. Look at verse 4, will you please? Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We know that God does not want us to do things that we're not responsible for. And one of the sources of frustration in the lives of many people is that they're trying to solve problems God hasn't called them to solve. They're trying to bear burdens or do things that God hasn't made them responsible for. But we do see that the Scripture says if any of these things about being in Christ are true, then bear you one another's burdens. Verse 4. Let this look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. If you go back to Galatians chapter 6 really quickly, I'd like to look at a similar command to the church of Galatia. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, verse 1 of 6, Galatians 6, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And then verse 2, the Bible says, Bear you one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Philippians 2, 4 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens. In other words, the mindset of the idea that if it isn't me, it isn't my business is not actually a Christian mindset either, is it? In other words, on the one hand, we are to clearly realize that there are things that we have no right to, and things that we are not responsible for. And if we try to take on us a right we don't have, or be responsible for something that we're not responsible for, we will have dire consequences. But don't we want to do something? Don't we want to help someone? Well, the Bible says that we have a responsibility about that. First of all, if there's any consolation in Christ, we are to be like-minded, and we are literally to have mercy. We are to 
bear the responsibility for our brethren in Christ. Chapter 6, we're actually talking about someone who is in sin being overtaken in a fault, and we're supposed to be responsible for getting them to do right. And in so doing, bearing one another's burdens. And I want us to take an overview that we have that's wrong and a micro view or a smaller view that's actually right. You know, we think we're responsible for the big problems of the world. We can't even communicate with the people who are responsible for the big problems of the world. We don't have access. I mean, if, if Donald Trump would just answer his purple phone, then I could tell him what I need him to do to fix the world's problems. But he doesn't have a purple phone. Just tweet him. I could tweet him. Mm -hmm. It's not my job to straighten out Donald Trump. It's not my job to call him and fix it, and he wouldn't let me. Uh, he wouldn't listen to me if I did call him. But you know, I am responsible for the people in this church. And I ought to do what I can for our people. I'm told to bear the burdens of the people in this church and fulfill the law of Christ in doing that. So that is my problem. You say, of course, you're pastor. No. That's my problem because I'm brother. I'm brother Price. And you're brother or sister. And it's your responsibility as well. And we are so focused on looking on our own things or looking on things that have nothing to do with us, we're missing the clear picture, which is to look on one another's things. A lot of people are upset and depressed because they can only see their problems or they can only see problems that they can do nothing about. And they never see anything that God actually wants them to do something about. They overlook that. It's like they're looking way off here or they're looking right here and they can't see right here. Does that make sense to you? And it's all because of a broken perspective. They are trying to be responsible for things they're not responsible for. Or they only care about things that maybe someone else or God is responsible for. But they're not concerned about the things God says they are responsible for. Be amazed at how serving other believers will solve your problems. Be amazed at how just serving other believers solve your problems. Some people want to solve the world's problems. Well, you're not supposed to. Just your brothers or sisters. Sometimes we want to solve problems that God says, no. There's a real reason that person has a problem. You ever look at somebody's life and you know why they have a problem? You ever look at somebody's life? They do drugs and they've got problems. And you want to fix the problems, but the problem really is a consequence of doing drugs. Or they're disobedient. They just won't obey God in a particular area and they've got problems. Well, my friend, you can't fix their symptoms of their problem. A little illustration I've heard a lot of times that works pretty well from my understanding is that trying to fix a symptom of somebody's problem is like trying to screw a filter on a muffler of a car because it's burning oil. Whereas you try to filter out the smoke when actually you need to stop whatever's causing oil to go where it doesn't belong. And that really makes life pretty simple, actually. There are so many things that you're responsible for that you're not doing. So many things you're not responsible for that you're focusing on. It's no wonder we're a mess. It's no wonder we struggle with our thinking, with our thoughts. And I hope it's a help to you just to realize God's very clear about what He wants us to be concerned with. And He's very clear about what He doesn't want us to be concerned with. And we can be a Saul or we can be a David. What was David's response when God said, 
David, this isn't a complaint of mine. I don't need you to build me a house. What was David's response? Okay. Okay. You know, that could be your response too. You're all upset about something that isn't right. And God's just clearly told you, not your problem. And you could say, well, but, 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 but. Or you could say, okay. And you'll be all right. Father, thank you for simple truth. And I ask that you would help it not to be muddied through much words or through man's speaking of it. But God, I just pray it be clear from your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's take prayer requests tonight.